Fairy tales don't have to make sense to be meaningful. They follow their own logic and readers, or traditionally listeners, get so enraptured in the story that no one really questions their elements, be they fairy godmothers, magic roses, or talking frogs. Yet, there's one story that always left me puzzled when I was growing up. The Princess and the Pea. Was a real princess really incapable of sleeping because of a hard pea underneath all of the fluffy layers? What did that tell people about wealth, femininity, and being a true princess instead um, of a commoner, of an ambitious commoner, not to say a potential con artist? What made her deserving of marrying the prince? What was the lesson that people were being taught? These are all valid questions that folklorists, historians, and literary scholars have written about. But for me, the main one has always been where the idea of piling mattress on top of mattress came from. Did no one find that sleeping arrangement weird? So let's swap Copenhagen for London. Let me take you back to a couple of centuries before the story, before Anderson wrote his tale, and tell you about early modern beds, from their practical aspects to their symbolic meanings. Hello lovely history fans, I'm Dr. Julia Martins and I'm a historian of gender and medicine. So I study how the body was understood in the past and how that shapes the present. If that's something that you're interested in, make sure to subscribe to this channel and support my work. So for now, let's dive into the world of early modern beds. Hans Christian Andersen first heard the tale of the princess and the pea as a child. It was probably a Swedish folk tale, which he later wrote down and published in 1835. The story sets out with an anxious prince who needs to marry, but alongside his mother, the queen, who's also very anxious, the prince worries about the many young women who could pretend to be of noble blood in the hope of marrying him. He needs to make sure he finds a real princess. So one stormy night, they find a woman by the castle gate, soaked by the rain. She tells them she is a princess and asks for shelter in the castle. The suspicious mother decides to test her refinement and her delicacy by placing a hard pea underneath a pile of 20 fluffy mattresses. In the morning, the girl tells the queen and the prince how she couldn't sleep, since there was something hard underneath the mattresses, which injured her body. This persuades both mother and son of her royal blood. Only a true princess could be so delicate as to be bothered by the hidden pea. So the couple marries and the pea is eventually displayed for all to see in a museum. A testament to the young woman's noble blood, of course, but also to the royal's ingenuity. Regardless of how you read the story, as a satire of nobility, as a reminder not to judge a book by its cover, as a tale of absurdity, it is telling that it was a bed that was chosen to showcase the difference between a pretender and someone who had grown up used to luxury and comfort. Let's take Elizabethan England as an example. Beds could be extremely expensive. Indeed, they were the items most often mentioned in wills and inventories of the period, besides money and land holdings. However, the way people slept varied greatly, depending on social status and wealth, as always. So at the very bottom, literally, there were those who would just lay on the floor wherever they could. A little bit more comfort would involve piles of straw to soften the earthen floor. Unfortunately, though, mice were eager to join in if that was the arrangement, which made this setup less than ideal, let's say. The next literal step up would be sleeping on a sack of straw, possibly on a raised platform off of the floor. This not only helped ward off vermin, but was particularly useful in the, in the drafty rooms of the time. Wooden box beds and rush mats were an improvement, as were the rope-strung truckle beds. They were easy to produce and created a net with some bounce to it over which the mattresses would then go. These beds could be easily moved out of the way underneath larger beds, which made it perfect for children or for servants. And then softer mattresses could be made of hay, flock or wool. These were much more comfortable than straw, but they were harder to maintain well, which was why these mattresses were usually piled on top of a straw mattress, which would, which would buffer the friction against the ropes. 
So within these mattresses, people often added aromatic herbs such as lavender. Just like today, it was believed that lavender would facilitate sleep. Warm wood and latest bed straw, on the other hand, would help with any insects that try disturbing your night's sleep. But what should go on top of all of this? Well, bolsters, pillows and blankets, along with lin linen pillowcases and sheets, would be the comfortable options. However, these were out of reach for most people. A prosperous couple might have pillowcases and sheets in their marital bed, but their children probably wouldn't, nor any servants that might work in the house, for instance. The next step up would include a feather bed, and bed in this period often meant mattress, so we're talking about mattresses still. So these were the most comfortable, not only the softest, but also the warmest beds you could sleep in. The more feathers and the smaller they were, the better. The down from eider ducks, so eider down, was widely believed to be the best option, which was reflected in its price. Once more, these feather beds were piled over a flock or hay mattress, which would, in its turn, be over a straw mattress against the ropes. Significantly, all of these beds slash mattresses could also have been used as a cover on top of the person sleeping. So if you had several beds or mattresses, you could just sleep in between them. So the more layers you had, the more comfortable you would be, and the tale of the princess and the pea is already sounding less strange. So what would the ideal Elizabethan bed be like? Well, the pile of mattresses, so rush mat, straw sack with herbs, flock bed, and ideally two feather beds with the best one on top, would all go inside a wooden bed frame and over the tightly strung ropes, which is where some people believe that the expression sleep tight comes from, as it was important for the ropes to be pulled tight with a wooden pad peg for the bed to be comfortable and not sagging in the middle. That's probably not true, though, in terms of the expression. But in any case, four poster beds were highly praised, especially with a headboard and wooden ceilings, or at least a thick fabric top. Around the bed, you would have heavy curtains, and maybe decorative silks would be hung, making the bed like a room within a room. So remember, most houses didn't have corridors, which meant that people often had to pass through other rooms to access their own. Curtains around the bed afforded a couple privacy, but they also made sleeping cozy and warm. On top of all the five layers of beds or mattresses, there would be sheets of linen, pillows and bolsters of feathers, plus blankets and a coverlet, which could be lined with furs and embroidered with precious materials. Although very few people could sleep in a bed like this in the early 16th century, it could cost more than a small farm even, by the end of the century that was much more likely, with a gradual increase in those who could afford it. Of course, for these beds to be truly luxurious, it was crucial to air the mattresses, to brush the wool curtains, and most importantly, to wash the linen. Early modern hygiene prioritized cleaning all the fabrics that would touch the body, as excrements such as sweat would leave the skin pores and get trapped in the fabric. And if you're, if you're interested in that subject, I have another video on Renaissance hygiene, which I will link down below. Anyway, washing the sheets helped to prevent the spread of bed bugs as well, which shouldn't be underestimated in this period. Still, as the century progressed, the sleeping standards of many people improved, especially for craftsmen, yeomen and members of the lower gentry. Chimneys proliferated, as did glazed windows. Bedsteads became more common, as did woolen and feather beds, so much more comfortable. Travelers such as William Harrison wrote of the cleanliness of the English inns where they stayed, and especially of their beds, with linen sheets wherein no man hath lodged since they came from the laundress. With the increase in travel at the time, some inns even used their beds as a way to attract visitors. So the Great Bed of Ware is the best example of that. It became a tourist attraction in its own right, as it could fit more than 10 people. Travelers could find it in the Hertfordshire town called Ware, where people would stop on their way from London to Cambridge. And most Elizabethan beds were 6 by 7 feet in size, but the Great Bed of Ware was 10.7 feet by 12 feet, and it was even mentioned by Shakespeare in Twelfth Night, when Sir Toby Belch described a sheet, a sheet of paper, as big enough for the Bed of Ware. 
So, and by the way, you can still see this bed at the V&A, the Victorian Albert Museum in London, which I highly recommend you do if you are in London. Anyway, naturally beds such as these were extremely uncommon. But as more and more people could afford to sleep in a comfortable bed, composed of several mattresses on top of each other, not only in England but in continental Europe too, those of noble birth could make their own beds even more luxurious, to signify their wealth and their superior social status and social class. And this brings me back to the princess and the pea, written down two centuries later. Perhaps the tale, and Anderson himself, was mocking the aristocracy and its need to be literally above the common folk, sleeping piled high over feather mattresses. In any case, it's clear that beds could be weaponized in the discourse about purity and refinement and where people belonged. If you couldn't feel a hard pee through all the mattresses, maybe you shouldn't be aspiring to marry a prince at all. Let me know in the comments what you think about this and whether you like this story growing up to begin with. And if you want to learn more, I added all the primary sources as well as a list of reading recommendations for you to browse below in the video description. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as it really helps the YouTube algorithm recommend the video to more people. And please consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you and see you next time.